So, tell me what's been going on. I saw you one month ago, and we put you back on some medicines. What's happened since then? Well, my breathing is real bad. It's no, it's no better at all? No, it's worse, really. So tell me about that. I'm afraid to lay down because I can't breathe too good. The first patient we saw was 87. I've been her doctor for six or seven years. Her recent problem is that she had a umbilical hernia that needed to be repaired. That required two hospitalizations and a rehab stay. And since that time, she's declining in function. And our workup has shown that she has progressive heart failure. I did an echo several years ago, and a repeat shows that her mitral valve is now failing. She has mitral regurgitation, which is mainly a surgical problem. What's wrong with you that makes you so short of breath? I don't know. I have no idea. Well, what you have is heart failure. Oh, well. Do you, remember that, the, do you remember those words? That doesn't bother me, though. I have no pain. That's good. Your heart is weak, and one of your valve leaks. Ooh. But because of her other comorbidities, she's a prohibitively high surgical risk. So I've been working with her to try to change the focus of our care from curative, which I don't think she can be cured anymore, to more comfort-based and symptom management. We've already talked to your son, and we figured out that there's two medicines that are on my list that may not be on your list. Yeah, well, I was kind of concerned about dropping Lipitor. Right, so you're off the Lipitor, which you're supposed to be on, and you're also supposed to be on a nitroglycerin product called Imder, and neither you nor your son knows about it, so what we've done is sent him home oh, to, collect, bring my to collect your medicines and bring them back, because uh -huh. we have got to make sure we have your list correct. She's currently very uncomfortable. She has intense heart failure symptoms. She can't sleep unless she's on four pillows. She wakes up in the middle of the night, very short of breath. This is despite my increasing medicines a month ago. You just noticed your really bad breathing, your legs swelling. Is there yeah. anything else that you've oh, noticed? Look at them, they're like a balloon. Yes, that's right. How's your memory doing? Your brain? Well, it's pretty good for an old lady like me. So the therapy is not working. Today we saw that the heart failure was worse. She's got increased fluid in her legs and her lungs. We've increased medications, but we also started a discussion about that we're losing ground and that I don't think we can cure her problem and that some realistic goals of what we can expect from it. Luckily, her son John was here, so who's a wonderful caregiver. They live together, so we were able to talk with both of them, started a discussion about end-of-life issues. I think her life expectancy is probably a year or two, something like that. And so uh, making sure she understands that and what our approach will be. The big advantage is that I've known her for several years. And so we have a long-term relationship and I know sort of how she thinks and what she wants. Also, she did see a cardiologist um, when she was in the hospital uh, who gave her the news. She doesn't remember all of that probably indeed. I think she's probably suppressed it. We want to always follow the patient's preferences wherever possible. Now, if somebody tells me, I never want to have surgery again, that's a bit dramatic. And I might say, let's talk about this specific case, this particular surgery. But she's made it clear to me that she's um, not afraid of dying, that she wants to be comfortable, and she really would like to avoid staying in the hospital. And those are reasonable goals, and I think we can try to meet those. You've got maybe 10, 12, 15 pounds of fluid extra. Yeah, it's all the way up to here. Mm -hmm. My legs touch when I walk. I think we probably need in her some more specific restrictions, at least to know what her wishes are, like wh whether she wishes to be resuscitated or to, um, to go on the ventilator. I didn't feel it was appropriate to push her that far today, but I planted that seed, and we'll talk about that further. And that's where a um, social worker or counselor would be very helpful. I can talk about it from a medical standpoint. I asked her to talk with her son, and uh, having a counselor help her think through those issues. Whatever she decides is fine with me. I've just told her that she has an illness that from which she's not going to recover, that I can't fix. That causes a lot of stress. It changes your whole life when doctors give you that message. So we find that a lot of folks just need some support to get through that, to come to grips with how to deal with it. I just wanted to tell me what she wants. Hold your breath just a minute. So I can mm -hmm. hold your breath. Design a pathway that meets her preferences. Good. Breathe. And now turn me this way. Great. For example, in our system, we have uh, masters prepared counselors that uh, are specifically trained in our palliative care service to deal with advanced directives 
and the options in chronic illness, in severe illness. So we, they talk about scenarios like uh, if you need to be hospitalized, you want to go to the operating room, transfusion, dialysis. So they'll kind of run through scenarios with people and kind of get their ideas. We will also then help them where appropriate to get a specific written document. For example, if a living will would be appropriate or if a patient wants to assign a durable power of attorney for health care. I'm not sure in her case we need that because she's got a loving son who clearly knows his mother and is going to advocate for her. Uh, he is going to take the lead to talk to her again when it's appropriate about these sensitive and sticky end-of-life issues. My counseling to the son is that his job is to tell me what his mother wants, not to tell me what he thinks is right. I appreciate his coming. The visit is more successful because this son comes with his mother. For example, if she becomes hospice eligible, which I don't think she is yet, then that whole array of professionals can be brought on board. I don't think we're there yet. I think we're on the way towards that. I would say she's in the last year or two of life, probably not this last six months. Since we know what she wants, his job is to act as a conduit. So if, for example, she loses the ability to make decisions, he will know from previous discussions what decision his mother would make and he can help transmit that to me and other physicians taking care of her so that we do the right thing. Do you have cases in that there's disagreement on what the patient wants, what the family wants, and perhaps what you think is best for them? Well, of course that's true. In, in fact, um, many patients have disagreements in their families. And even in this case, let me say it's not clear cut because I probably won't be at the hospital when she has her catastrophe. The physician she meets will be someone she's never seen before. And so our system is not set up very well for continuity. So I need to make sure that if she has wishes, that they are very clear and that she brings them with her so that when she has a, a crisis, that whatever her wishes are, they can be respected. If we get to the point where the medicines don't work and it would go to being on a lung machine, a ventilator with a tube in your throat to breathe for you, or things like that, we would let, need to know if you would want to have that therapy or not. Because mm. when that happens, you may not be able to tell us. You'd be so, so short of breath. So as we work together, I don't want to distress you, but I want you to think about those things and just talk with your son and just decide what's the best thing for you. It's not up to me to convince people to make, to make a specific choice. It's my job to give them options. However, I, I do think it is also my job to give them specific advice. So if they ask me what they would do, I don't, don't say, well, here's, it's your choice. I do give them advice, but make it clear that I will support their decision. If they want resuscitation or don't want, either of those are choices. And I may have an opinion about it, but I tell them, you know, it's, it's your choice. You need to give me direction in that area. Also, at some point, if we use hospice, then we can actually write it into the orders for hospice that she is to get this or not to get this. I mean, people do have a choice in this matter. Now, you're doing pretty good. You're able to tell me what you want. Are there any restrictions in care that you don't want? For example, if your heart would get very, very weak, would you want us to put you on a breathing machine or shock your heart or do those heroic measures? Mm. Have you thought about that before? No, I hadn't thought about it. You don't need to think about that right now, mm. but I think your heart disease is getting to the point where if there's anything you don't want me to do, or you don't want doctors to do, we should know. And that's really your choice. Mm -hmm. But I think if you stick with families, you talk to them, you tell them the truth, you provide choices, people 90 plus percent of the time will make decisions that are reasonable. Keep that in reserve. My opinion from having worked with the cardiologist before is they'll say, let's try the medicines. Mm. Because of your fibrillation, because of your age, because of your weakened heart, Mm. Because of your diabetes, all those things put together, I think your risk of having a valve replacement is very high.